I am just going to start with the most um, upvoted question while we wait for, for new ones to come in. Um, do you fear the Shoggoth? And should we? <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be a little bit crazy not to. Maybe I just, I spent too much of my time hanging out with AI safety researchers. That was the company I worked for used to be an AI safety lab. So I just kind of hear people whose whole job it is is to invent the worst case scenario stories, like the most horrific things that could possibly happen, and like write them in detail in essays. So, so you do go, this could go terribly wrong. Uh, like power in the wrong hands, like us being careless about how we build models, just like exponential scale that we can't control could go wrong in many ways. I think small and big. I don't think it's like, I'm not on board with like all of humanity will die in 10 years, which some people are, I'm not there. Um, but I think like many small tragedies are probably gonna happen. And then we'll learn from them and then build more robust systems and like all survive as a civilization, hopefully. And hey, Matt? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of aware of all the dumb things I tried to do as a 14 year old kid. And now suddenly like there is this, this tool with enormous amount of knowledge in it will tell me exactly how to do them. And that's, that's you know, one, one side of things. I think the, the subtle changes in LLMs is something that makes me slightly more nervous, right? Um, what kind of biases are implicit in these things uh, which will lead us in particular directions, like the chat GPT bias towards action. Um, but what, what is that doing? And can we kind of expose that? Can we make it more transparent? Can we talk about it? Um, yeah, I think both of you talked a lot about this sort of dichotomy of, you know, the, the Shoggoth or then the, the, the mask that we, we, we paint on it. You know, I think the other term that people use a lot is like a feral models and then the house trained, you know, models. Um, Matt, I wanted to ask you, you know, you described the problem of, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the clock sort of inventing things because of the chat GPT post training. Um, did you, when you initially built it, this was before ChatGPT, I believe, or did you use like a more feral model, like a GPT-3 row or, or, or a DaVinci 2? And like, how has that experience been sort of like working with different types of models? Um, it's, so one of the things I like make a joke about is being like an LLM sommelier, right? You end up with, I think somebody has literally launched a site for like tasting notes, have you run across this? <laughs> no, uh, okay. For different models. Um, I find, it's, it's funny, like using GPT-3 was pretty good. Uh, 3.5, like the responses that came out were much more reliable, uh, but the words were like really basic words. GPT-4 like uses more kind of like, you know, expensive words. It feels like coming from like fancy newspapers. Like uh, Delve. Oh, uh, Delve. <laughs> so Delve is a really interesting one, right? You should. Is this is like, so I don't know if people know, but like um, one way you can tell if text was written is like delve is used by GPT-4 and previous models way more than any normal human would ever use that word. But it turned out, didn't they fine tune it or the way they did reinforcement learning was mostly with Nigerian workers. And for some reason, the word delve is very common in Nigeria. They just use it all the time. And so this became part of GPT-4's like fingerprint. And I think that would be a great way to explore sort of like the weird implicit biases that end up in and the economic inequality that we both benefit and, and cause. But maybe we'll leave that for, for later and ask some audience <laughs> questions for, for a change. Um, the most popular question here is, um, could LLMs eventually replace traditional search engines? I mean, I think for context, you know, we've had this week, you know, last week we had the Google uh, f combination of success and mm -hmm. failures of uh, releasing the kind of like the Gemini search box. Yeah. Um, you know, is that just basically, does it mean that we can't use uh, LLMs for search or is well, there a different future? Okay, it depends on cost. I'm going to say like at the moment, it's more expensive to use language model semantic search than just like a keyword search or like some kind of, that'll be much faster and cheaper. But... I don't know, like language models have always been part in some degree of, of traditional Google search. Like Google's been doing machine learning and, and neural networks for like decades. Like they were like the original people that came up with this mm -hmm. stuff before everyone defected to open AI. Um, so I think it's more a thing of like how much, like how expensive is the language model you're using in your search query? I mean, unless you're doing pure keyword matching, but I feel like almost all search engines at this point have semantic meaning baked in, which is some form of yeah. language model neural network. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the two differences for me is one is that building a really good search engine is now really easy. Yeah. So um, again, I have some code around this using um, models on Cloudflare and Vectorize to build like a really good semantic search engine in like a hundred lines of code. And it's insane how easy it is. These kind of things like, you know, synonym matching or like kind of type what I mean, never used to be easy to do as kind of an individual. And now with embeddings, it's possible. I think the more disruptive point is um, what is the point of first intent when you want to learn about something? 
Like search has never been a kind of a like look up an encyclopedia thing. When you start searching, you're learning the right words to use. You're learning about the domain, and it's always been conversational. And mm. Google has never supported that very well, right? It's what we can term an epistemic journey, and Chat GPT is a, or chat interfaces are really good for epistemic journeys. Now, can we bring both of that kind of like research and knowledge journeys together? Yeah, I think Exa AI does this really well. If people have tried that, I would suggest that if you're trying to understand how semantic search is different to something like Google. I mean, Perplexity does this a bit, but it's a search engine where they've used heavily like semantic uh, embeddings and semantic search. So you can just type in like, show me tweets where people are like really angry about the latest voting results or something, and it'll just give you tweets much better than Twitter search engine. But it understands you can type in paragraphs, and it gives you results that are pretty close to what you were probably looking for. So it understands like. Semantic meaning and intent far more than keywords. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. To kind of touch on this epistemic journey a bit, like one of the things that I, I, I find uh, you know most interesting about this idea of like getting AI to do things faster for us, um, you know, for example, summarizing something is that what I find that often in order to learn something or really to internalize some you know piece of new knowledge, I actually need to just spend a long time with it and like looking at a whole bunch of things and going down like rabbit holes that don't end up working out, and then at the end of it, I f build a full world model. And now in the future, that world model will only exist in the machine, and it just gives you an answer, and you can go by a merry way. But what does it do to your understanding of like, the world around you and around us? Yeah. Uh. I mean, to give you an example on that, so I, I have an app which, like, long story short, it has an arrow that always points towards the center of the galaxy. And so it has a lot of rotations involved in that. The maths behind doing rotating things in three dimensions and combining them is quaternions. I've been trying to understand quaternions for, I'm not kidding, 10 years. And uh, every time I talk to people about it, they give me baffling answers. ChatGPT4 is finally something which has infinite patience and uh, got me to the point of understanding, maybe not in a deep way, but enough in order to be able to use it, understand quaternions for the first time. And so there is something, there's a kind of an interesting glimmer there about like, what kind of journey it takes me on. And the world model ends up in my head in the end. Yeah, I would hope it'd be better at you building world maps faster. Like in the, the company I'm in, and like the circles I'm in, world maps becoming this big, I don't know, hot talking point past text generation where, where if someone's trying to say I need to like map all the like cells that affect cancer or something, like all the different types of like organisms that are involved in this, a human doing that can take like years and years and how are you ever going to synthesize all this research? But this is the kind of thing that, that machine learning is actually great for, is synthesizing tons of stuff into a world model that humans can understand. Um, as long as you still have human in the loop processes and you're like involving humans in the, in the knowledge work, hopefully it just gets you to a world model faster and you still have a very clear understanding of the space and trust that world model, but you don't have to spend years building it up. You might be able to build a small one for a particular topic, but if tons of researchers are trying to build world models like across domains on complex subjects, this is where they can really help us actually get to those quickly. Mm, interesting. Um, let me jump onto some audience questions kind of like related to, you know, this sort of, I think both of you touched on the uh, sort of constraining of, of models and like small models in general. Um, I think here's one question which may not be possible to answer in, in, in concrete means, but how small can an LLM be to be still useful? Um, as in like, what, is there like a sort of like a minimum size in terms of just like the compute required, the, you know, the space required? How, how small can we make these to do tasks for us? I actually don't know. I'm trying to think of like people who have told me they've built their own models, but I think it took months. Well, I don't know how much GPU access they had, but I feel like you still need a, like a, a substantial amount of language to get the model to just put out coherent sentences before you get it to do anything interesting. So some base level of like language knowledge it needs before you can actually specialize it. Have yeah. you tried building it's, one? <laughs> it's outside my domain. I will yeah. say that using anything less than GPT 3.5 level has not been reliable. And Apple had to do kind of like genuinely novel research to squash that onto phones. Mm -hmm. So that's their, their model equivalent. It, so it feels like you know, that kind of stuff is going to end up being you know, potentially local or on device. Um, yeah, but cloud for a while, I think. Mm -hmm. So if the task is just to write a two-line poem about the time, you still need to know everything about the world in order to, uh, <laughs> to, to do that. Which yeah. may, may be true, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think you need to understand yeah. nouns and verbs and sentence structure and adjectives to, to yeah. do a two-line poem. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, okay, so um, a kind of related question here. Um, 
this is also uh, touching on the Shoggoth. Um, are there good open source base models that are sort of more in the sort of like feral uh, state that we can apply reinforcement learning to ourselves to constrain their behavior? So instead of having to start from scratch, having to use all of that compute to build out like language, you know, reasoning, is there like a starting point that you can then tweak yourself? I think like Llama's the most promising, mm. like that's the big open source model that, um, and then all the weights got leaked, I mean, <laughs> okay. um, maybe intentionally or not. Um, I haven't actually looked into that much of the open source stuff and building your own models. <laughs> I'm so far on the end of like, take the already constrained models and constrain the more side of things. I haven't attempted to make them more un unreliable. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's kind of my place in yeah. the ecosystem as well. Um, from what I understand, like Llama 3 is the place to look and people doing work on Hugging Face and Replicate is kind of where to go. Uh, it's pretty, like the one or two times I've kind of run stuff locally, just to kind of a test, it's been pretty wild just to kind of go, oh, when I'm not hitting the cloud, I can integrate this in sort of like new ways. Um, and one kind of shout out for a good place to start is Simon Willison's command line tool, LLM, uh, which makes it really easy to um, uh, install uh, different models, both locally and provide access in the cloud, uh, and to like use it to pipe to and from. And he just, if you check out his um, Twitter, he just did a talk about this and about how to use it with some ideas. Yeah, I'll give a shout out there as well. Um, you know, if you're already using OpenAI's APIs, there's this uh, uh, great project called OpenRouter uh, that basically has an exactly the same API as OpenAI, but it routes to hundreds of different models. So if you want to just, in your app that already exists, you just want to try what that would look like when you use a different model, you can just use this as a proxy and, and route your traffic to, to, to any of them. Um, now, talking about this um, sort of like concept of, uh, uh, I guess, QA, uh, you know, Maggie, you talked a lot, a lot about this, you know, sort of like validating the information is correct. Mm -hmm. And Matt, you described your process of making an LLM read and other mm -hmm. LLMs output and whatever. But like, what is the actual like, you know, professional status quo or the best practice for, for, for QAing, mm -hmm. um, you know? Yeah, um, I, I feel like what Alyssa, I don't know if we're like, at the edge of working on this, but we have people who are like, okay, we have people paying us to be, make models as accurate as possible. Like large consultancies and pharma companies and medical companies will pay a lot to be like, hey, I was otherwise gonna pay four humans to do this for eight months. Can you do it for cheaper than their salary? So it's a lot, it's a lot of money that you have to test um, whether you can get models to be accurate. And we found we can, but you do a lot of calls. So like when we get, um, we ask like, okay, um, extract you know, the dosage of these 10,000 papers or extract who, who was studied it in what countries. Uh, it could be hundreds of steps in that process where you're double checking at every stage and you're doing a whole bunch of these, like, like I talked about, kind of compositional chaining of lots and lots of different tasks and then getting different models to double check all the other models and using GPT-4 as much as possible. So you, it costs money. Like we've, we have an intern who will just like burn, frankly, tens of thousands of dollars sometimes on experiments, but then gets the accuracy rate over 95%, which is really great. So if you are willing to pay money, you can make language models more accurate than humans. That's like, that's for sure. It's just a matter of like finding the right composition and prompts and double checking enough. Yeah. Have, you, have you found any kind of good tooling to do that? Because like, at the moment, I'm kind of like rolling my own shonky yeah. tooling, right? Like it's... Yeah, we built a tool called ICE, Interactive Compositional Explorer. It's like some terrible right. name that the developers came up with um, that does this, that will show you every single step and allow you to roll your own. But frankly, we built this before Langchain came out, which is now like another tool that's very popular for chaining language model things together and including agents and web search and databases. I feel like Langchain might actually be a better right. developer experience, but otherwise we have one. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't name or recommend anyone because I haven't tried them myself, but yeah. I think the last Y Combinator batch had four different startups trying to oh, build nice, LM nice. tools. So I think that <laughs> people who are in business of selling pickaxes are going to be selling a lot of pickaxes, and some of them yeah. are probably going to be good. Um, I've run across Human Loop as well. Mm. And, yeah, human. and it's, it's interesting, right? Like, we're in this kind of, it feels like, you know, with digital, we sort of like had this about 15 years ago where there was no good tooling or observability for anything. And you know, everyone was kind of rolling their own, and we kind of figured out what best practice was. Like, and it took, kind of took some time, uh, but it's still, you know, it's still the wild west a bit. Mm -hmm. Nice, um, great jumping off point to the next question. So, touching on on you know cost and and reliability and tooling. Um, on this agent thing that you built, Laris, um, what if Bruno went for a walk and you forgot that he's not present? How can uh, you know AI trust or verify human input before starting its expensive compute? 
like, um, you know, like you could imagine that this thing could run, you know, pointlessly for a very long time until you cut off its budget. Uh, how can we sort of like improve? Um, so this is, this is um, kind of agent sort of transparency, observability, how do you interrupt it? Um, there are no good user experience patterns for this. This is one of the reasons I find it interesting. Um, you know, I, was, I had an agent a while back uh, that I was using to experiment with this kind of ask the user for clarifying information. And this one, it was, um, I asked it to tell me the weather. Um, you know, what, what's the current weather? But I didn't tell it my city. So it asked me um, what city you're in. And I would say like London, UK, and it would like be able to like go off to the web and like find the lat long and uh, put that to a weather API, give me the weather back. And the next time I ran it, I was like, oh, you know what? Um, it says what city you're in, and I'm like, I'm not gonna tell you, is what I said. And it started panicking. And it was like, right, well, what's your, what's your lat long? I'm, I'm not gonna tell you. And it was like, uh, do you have Google Maps? And it started Googling for like apps I could install to find the lat long. And it's like, right, do you have Google Maps? I'm like, no. And then it's like, right, okay, you need to go and install this app. Now go and press the settings button. Now go and do this. Now go and do that. And suddenly we're like kind of, you know, 14, you know, conversational steps deep in an interaction where it's telling me to like yak shave something in order that it can answer my original goal. And the question is like, what happens if like one of those kind of suggestions is like, right, now go and walk into traffic or something. Um, so yeah, we're kind of, this is agent, I think, is this the AI alignment problem? This is right? the AI, the, the alignment, AI problem. alignment problem, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. So like you have a, they talk about outer goals and inner goals. So you're gonna set an outer goal, like, hey, like get me the weather for my location. And the, the model might say that's a completely different inner goal, like find the person's lat long, and this misalignment can lead to bad things. <laughs> Maximize the number of paper clips in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we don't have a question, audience question about this, but I think this agents thing is like sufficiently interesting. I, I know Maggie that you've done some UI UX experiments into sort of like agentive you know systems. Like w what I'm seeing a lot right now is that there's a lot of really cool demos because the the eighty percent case is kind of easy to build. You know, like you can make a, a dolphin that paints stars and you know etc. But like, what would it take to go from you know where we are right now into sort of like for any particular domain? You know, what are the, what what is the big gap that we need to 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 jump over? I kind of think it might be boring QA and like boring prompt engineering and like architectures. Because I've seen a lot of demos of like there's a lot of new agent products coming out, like Lindy uh, is like one of the ones that seems more capable. But they still aren't that reliable. You'll ask it to be like, hey, read my emails and like schedule all the calendar events that are mentioned in these emails and like respond to those people telling them when our meeting is. And even that you can kind of screw up on basic things or it misses stuff. Like the quality level is just still not high enough. We can see potential. Like it's still, you're like, oh, it can achieve most of these things. But it just, it's screwed up enough, like what you said, like one in 15, you're like clock on tell the time. It's that kind of mistake level. Um, enough that you couldn't really get people to pay for this and have it be an, an, an in-production app. I think that's just going to be the boring work of going through every single prompt over and over and over again and being like, right, why didn't it catch this one place? Oh, it doesn't understand that phrase. Oh, like write an, an ad additional prompt and, you know, make that Ed, all, catching all the edge cases is essentially mm. like programming, right? You catch all the edge bugs kind of thing. This is like standard programming at some point. <laughs> yeah. Did you see the Apple Intelligence launch, yeah. the keynote? Um, it's worth watching the last 30 minutes of this because one of the, one of the features is Siri is basically becoming like this little micro agent, yeah. right? So it can kind of do tasks for you on your phone. And one of the questions is like, how does that work? There's a really, they didn't say this like kind of specifically, there's a really interesting clue on it is that your phone, your iPhone now comes with a detailed guide about how to perform any task on your phone. So it's like, oh, how do I, how do I send a text message later? <laughs> and it's like four steps. It's like kind of like open a text messages app, write the text message, press this button, press this button, now you're done. And they build this as a kind of a handy user-facing feature. Oh, there's a guide for your phone. Now, if you've built a bunch of agents, what you know is that that is being loaded from a semantic database according to a user query, and the agent will use that as a series of actions it will run as part of the kind of orchestration mm -hmm. step. So it's a guide written in plain English. It's also really detailed instructions to make sure the agent does exactly what the agent should be doing uh, without hallucinating too much. And I think a lot of these tasks are going to be like, you know, how do I buy a book? How do I buy a holiday? Uh, sorry, book a holiday with an agent. Somebody is going to need to go down and write the sequences of steps thousands upon thousands of times. And that's going to be like an important part of it.
Amazing. Um, we only have a few minutes left, and we have a very long list of questions. Your talks have been either uh, very popular or very confusing, one of those two. <laughs> um, no. Uh, th th there's a lot of great questions that I hope that people can come and ask from you from you know when they see you trying to get to the bathroom or something, they can stand in your way and uh, ask. But I will ask this, because this is the one that interests me the most. This is, Maggie, this is come, uh, relating to your talk. Um, can we learn something from naming all the 12,000 dimensions that <laughs> these models have figured out about us humans? And is there already a list? Like, could, could these dimensions actually give us lingo and, and help us understand humanity in like a way that is deeper than humans understand ourselves? I hope so. This is the stuff that seems more interesting to me. And okay, I'm gonna put a bet on that the people who are gonna do this, if anyone can, is anthropic. Like they're doing the most interesting research on trying to, on what we call interpretability. So like making the inner workings of the model interpretable or understandable to us. And they put out a paper last month that everyone went wild over because it was amazing. It was like where they had figured out a way to get the model to visually represent some of its clusters and then label them. So they found like they could identify where the concept of the Golden Gate Bridge was in one of their large models like uh, neural network like memories. And then they could kind of clamp on to that, they called it clamping, so that when they asked this particular model to talk about anything, all it would talk about was the Golden Gate Bridge. It was like obsessed with the Golden Gate Bridge. You'd be like, where should I take my girlfriend for a date? And it was like, the Golden Gate Bridge is the most gorgeous place in the whole world, you know, going on, anything you asked. Um, where it was an interesting way of constraining the model, but another output of this was just like, they had this partial map of actually what the model can see. Like the stuff I showed in my slides about like sausage and tax, before that point in time, we didn't actually, we couldn't see that. We knew that was how it was working on the inside, but we couldn't like literally see where every concept was in space. And they made it possible too, which was really exciting. Um, so I'm betting if anyone's gonna do it, they're gonna find a way to get the model to name all the dimensions of the, how things move around and relate in space. Yeah. Nice. And Matt, a final one for you, because you, you know, you've been in this uh, forefront of this booty and putting AI into the physical world, you know, with the clock. Um, but, you know, we see a lot of uh, uh, releases of sort of like AI devices, you know, like uh, R1, Rabbit One or AI, whatever these, these, you know, pins and people are. Is there anything that you're excited there? Are there any tool, things that people should look at? Um, so I picked up a Rabbit, um, mm -hmm. Rabbit R1, like mainly because of the industrial design by Teenage Engineering. Um, I'm less interested in the um, assistant level things. I think, personally, I'm more drawn to very, very specific devices. Um, there was a prototype that came out recently um, called Transfer Scope, which is a handheld device that can pick up images of things around you and then remix them in your hand. And it just felt like a, mm. such a beautiful kind of um, precision tool to interact with the world around us in a very smart way, which wasn't kind of like, you know, having a buddy which is going to do tasks for me, which just feels a bit like kind of the lazy solution. Um, so those very specific things I'm interested in. Nice. Well, that was all we had time for, but please do ask our speakers questions when you run in the hallway track. Um, and I think now we are going to go for lunch, unless Yuho is trying to uh, catch our attention. Yuho needs to explain lunch to us. Uh, okay, sure. No, it's not. Anyway, uh, let's, uh, should we just say goodbye to our speakers first? Yes, we should. Thank you very much, Madam Maggie. Thank you. Thank you.